Welcome back, everyone. We are now going to discuss one of my favorite topics on the bar exam, which is commercial paper. And before I talk about commercial paper, which is very easy, and the main thing is about memorizing the requirements of negotiability, which I already have a student in here who has memorized properly, it's really not that difficult. What I think is more difficult is conceptualizing the idea of commercial paper, recognizing it as an issue on an essay, and then writing a well-written uh, few paragraphs to get the appropriate amount of points. So before I even go into the material itself, I just kind of want to talk about the concept of commercial paper and what commercial paper means to me. So many of you might not know this, but I have a, a tutoring company, Ibis Prep, and we teach for a lot of different subjects. Besides the bar exam, our other main test is the Series 7, Series 66, SIE, the financial licensing exams. So I've passed those exams. I teach for those exams. I deeply understand the concepts of financial instruments. They don't test it on the bar exam in a deep manner at all. They don't test you about stocks or bonds. Stocks and bonds are known as securities. So if you ever hear that word or they put it on the test, a security, it can be confusing because here we talk about secure transactions, like we are securing something with collateral. We're gonna talk about article nine, but if you hear the word securities, it means stocks or bonds. And that is gonna be excluded from article three commercial paper. That whole world of stocks and bonds, long-term investments is a financial conversation. We're focused on the short-term representations of mediums of exchange, let's call it. That's a great way to understand what commercial paper is. It's a short-term loan. In the financial sector, it's not supposed to last for more than 270 days, not something you need to memorize. You just need to know here in, on the bar exam, commercial paper is a loan, right? You are lending someone money, but you're not giving them money. You're giving them a medium of exchange. So in particular, what is commercial paper? A medium of exchange for money that does not include cash or securities. I had to start with that background because people hear that definition they're like what does securities mean it really means stocks or bonds long-term investments i could simplify it by saying in investing in finance there's instruments known as notes there's instruments known as bills and there's instruments known as bonds bonds are long-term bills and notes are more short-term so you might hear that word a bill or a note that might signify some sort of, sort of short-term instrument. But to narrow in, to fine tune it on how they test it on the Florida bar exam, they're testing it through the lens of Article 3, commercial paper, negotiable instruments. So like I said, commercial paper is a medium of exchange for money that does not include cash or securities. A note, a draft, an IOU, right? That's what we're looking for. A piece of paper that someone gives someone else that they can pretty much cash in, like a check is a great example of thinking about a commercial paper instrument. So once we understand that kind of conception that what is commercial paper? Commercial paper is a medium of exchange for money that does not include cash or securities. We get that commercial paper is going to be regulated under Article 3 of the UCC, as opposed to Article 2, which is regular contract law. So you'll hear that a lot in, in this lecture about the difference between Article 3 and Article 2, potentially when we talk about holders in, in due course, how they'll be subject to the real defenses and not the personal defenses. Those personal defenses are going to be the contract defenses. When we also talk about the elements of negotiability of commercial paper, which is going to be, and we'll hear this many times today, but let's make it one time, a signed, written, unconditional promise to pay a fixed sum of money with or without interest on demand or definitive time to order a bearer with no additional undertakings. That is what makes commercial paper negotiable. Negotiable means, can I give it to someone else? Can I transfer it? So that's what we're talking about. Commercial paper is the instrument itself and it's a negotiable instrument 
because it's negotiable, meaning I can transfer it to someone else. We're going to transfer it either by signing it to someone, if it's order paper, or giving it to someone simply by possession, if it's bearer paper. But when I was talking about Article 2 versus Article 3, imagine a scenario where you see a, a promissory note, and I promise to pay Rihanna a million dollars if the Eagles win the Super Bowl, period. That right there is a condition if the Eagles win the Super Bowl, right? Therefore, it does not fall under the regulation of Article 3. It'll fall under Article 2 because it's not a negotiable instrument. It's simply a contract if the Eagles win the Super Bowl. So you could very likely have something on the test that looks like commercial paper. You'll analyze it as commercial paper, but at some point in your analysis, it'll turn out to be a contract. And you'll say, therefore, since this um, promissory note includes a condition of negotiability, it is not negotiable and therefore is simply a contract that's between the original parties. That's just kind of a conceptualizing way of understanding commercial paper, negotiable instruments, article three. So we have a note or a draft, right? A note is a two-party instrument. A draft is a three-party instrument. The note is like an IOU. It's just one person to another person. And you'll see it on the essay. It'll be like, Johnny gives Tommy a note which states, I promise to pay you, Johnny, which makes it order paper, $100,000 plus 6% interest. Usually there's interest because why else would you do this? You know, on December 24th or on the, right? They'll give you, they'll, they'll really tease it up for you or they'll just slip it in there and be like, he gives him a check. Well, if you see a check, a check is actually not a note. A check is a draft. What makes a check a draft? An intermediary, a three-party transaction, right? Whereas a note only requires two parties, the check will, or any type of draft will require three parties. So the note is just gonna have the maker and the payee. In this world, they're gonna kind of use the words maker and drawer synonymously, meaning the person who drew the instrument or made the instrument. But I think technically we should think of maker and payee for a note. For a draft, you have the drawer, the person who draws it, then you'll have the bank, who's the third party intermediary. Now, this is a kind of confusing party because they have a, a dual relationship, right? In their relationship with the drawer, they're the draw E, right? They're the one who is getting drawn upon. But in the relationship to the person who's cashing in the check, they're the payor, which makes that person who's cashing in the check the payee. So if we can run that back, a note is a two-party instrument, which includes a maker and a payee. A draft is a three-party instrument, which has a drawer, then a draw e slash payor, which is the bank, the third-party intermediary, then me, the guy who gets to cash it in and go buy toys, right? That's going to be the way that a check works. A check is literally a draft. Now, we're going to have to get through this is it negotiable? Once we determined, is it commercial paper regulated under Article 3 because it's a medium of exchange that does not include cash or securities? Once we determined who are the parties and is it a note or a draft, a two-party instrument or a three-party instrument, first off, we got a lot of points already, so that's cool. Second off, we've made it to the only thing you really, really, really need to memorize that is just foreign, that's just like a poem that we're going to say over and over again today. A signed, written, unconditional, promise to pay, a fixed sum of money, with or without interest, on demand at a definitive time to order a bearer with no additional undertakings. This isn't the only time we're going to mention that today. You're going to get sick of hearing that phrase. If you can spit that phrase out and go through the analysis, is it signed? Is it written? Um, is it a promise to pay? You know, that's points, points, points. You're doing an amazing job. You don't need to be a... a you know, a stock trader, and trust me, stock traders don't even know this stuff. Nobody knows this stuff except for us because we're taking this test. It's very foreign and like everything is automated. You know, we don't really 
see it in practice that much, but whatever, it's on the test. We want to see this on the test so we can crush it by spitting out these points. We've identified as a commercial paper. We're looking to see um, who are the parties. Is it a note or a draft? We want to know, has it uh, been properly negotiated? And I told you before, it can be negotiated one of two ways. If it's order paper, it needs to be signed over to the order of. If it's bearer paper, then it needs to be by possession. What's a good example of bearer paper? A cashier's check. Have you ever heard of that? Um, what, what else do they call that? A cashier's check. Uh, a money order, right? Whoever has it is entitled to cash it in. So that's what we're thinking about with bearer paper. So once you've gone through that analysis, like is it commercial paper? Who are the parties? Is it a note or a draft? Does it satisfy the conditions of negotiability? Has it been properly negotiated? And if it's order paper, it has to be negotiated through a signature. We call that an endorsement, right? They're trying to trick you on the test. Like, oh, Tommy's illiterate. So instead of signing it, he picks his nose and puts a booger on, the, on it. <laughs> Literally, like that's still a signature. A signature is just any manifestation to uh, assent to a contract with some sort of uh, mark, let's call it. The bugger example is a little bad, but like it could be any, any mark. Okay, so now we've seen, has it been transferred? Well, now we look at it and say, okay, so Tommy had it. Tommy transferred it to Johnny. We gotta look at Johnny. Why? Because we wanna determine if Johnny has become a holder in due course. Now, this is where I tell people that you know about promissory notes. And similarly, you know about secure transactions, Article 3 and Article 9, because you know about property law and mortgages. And just like in mortgages, you can have, um, there's a note and a security agreement, right? The note is the promise to pay the mortgagee back. The collateral is the house. That's property law. Property law is specifically exempted from Article 3 and Article 9, but the concepts remain the same where the loan and the security agreement in property operate very similarly to a commercial paper, negotiable instrument, and an Article 9 secured transaction. In Article 9, we'll see that the PMSI mirrors the PMM. But here in commercial paper, what I want you all to think about is how the holder in due course mirrors the bona fide purchaser. A bona fide purchaser is someone in real property who takes for value without notice in good faith. So too, in commercial paper, one who takes for value without notice and in good faith is a holder in due course. We would love to be able to have a discussion about is Johnny a holder in due course and why is that important? And why is that important if you're a holder in due course? Because holders in due course will only take subject to the real defenses not the personal defenses. The personal defenses are going to be those contract defenses, right? The real defenses are going to be um, applicable still. The acronym FADES, fraud in the factum, alteration, inducement, uh, duress or discharge in court, statute of limitations or suretyships. Um, those are uh, ways that um, we can apply the real defenses to um, a holder in due course, but we cannot apply the personal defenses. So to back that up, a holder in due course is someone who takes the instrument for value, they paid for it. Here's a note, I paid $20 for this note, right? If you just give me the note, it's gifted to me without notice. Well, hey, this note is actually fit, you know, that's notice. Or um, this note is actually owned, can only be cashed in by some, like that's notice, but you don't have that. And then in good faith, good faith, all of the UCC is governed by good faith. Good faith is very important. So we've had this whole discussion now where how has Johnny gotten the instrument? Well, first, the instrument was commercial paper. It was a medium exchange that does not include cash or securities. Second off, it was a draft because it was a three-party instrument, which included the um, drawer, the draw e slash payor, and the payee. Then it was negotiable because it conformed with the requirements of negotiability. It was a signed, written, unconditional promise to pay, a fixed sum of money with or without interest, on demand or definitive time to order bear no additional undertakings. 
It was order paper, which required an endorsement and was properly endorsed. And furthermore, since Johnny paid for the instrument, he became a holder in due course, which meant that he was only subject to the real defenses and not the personal defenses. Therefore, this defense you're trying to make that, um, that uh, there was some sort of impracticality or impossibility of performance or something, that's a contract defense. That won't apply. He's, he's cool with that. So we've made it to, is Johnny a holder in due course? Very similar to the bona fide purchaser in property. You, you'd love to be a holder in due course. And just like the BFP in property, there's also the same concept in commercial paper of the shelter rule, where you will take shelter in the status of a holder in due course if you take after them, right? So you will take upstream shelter in a holder in due course. If Johnny becomes a holder in due course because he pays for the instrument and then gives it to me, I can take shelter in his status and I would only be subject to the real defenses, not the personal defenses. So we've marched all the way down to, you know, we see the instrument, we talked about the instrument, we talked about is it negotiable, we talked about how it, be, how it was negotiated, we talked about the holder in due course and that they could potentially take shelter. And then we reached the end of the, of the essay the warranties, the transfer warranties, and the presentment warranties. And I've seen commercial paper essays that don't even talk about these warranties, but it is true to talk about. In commercial paper, there are these warranties that are implied, and transfer warranties are exactly what you would think them to be, that the person who is transferring the instrument is entitled to transfer it, that there's no defect or fraud or alteration or you know, anything on the instrument itself. And it's the same for the presentment warranties, the same, except instead of that they're authorized to transfer the instrument, they're authorized to present the instrument. And, and think about it, a check has that. When you get a check, you are authorized. I could sign it over to anyone. I could just turn it on the back and say to Tommy, and then it becomes order paper to Tommy and Tommy could cash it in. Technically a check is bearer paper. Whoever has the check can cash it in. I could cash a check that's written to a lot of different names, even if it doesn't say my name, right? So be careful. Don't just let anyone hold a check for you. But if you turn on the back and you write to Rihanna, that becomes order paper where only Rihanna could cash it in. So you guys deal, you guys, gals, happy Galentine's today. You deal with um, commercial paper all the time, right? And you know that when you have a check, you're entitled to transfer it to your buddy, just to Tommy transfer it. And you know that when you have a check, when you go to the bank and say, give me my money, they're going to give it to you. It's just become very foreign. It gets more and more foreign every year because nowadays you just like bling, cash my check. And, you know, you don't think about that you're presenting it for enforcement and all of that. So, you know, that was my introduction. I think that was a full, uh, very full introduction on commercial paper. I'm going to go through uh, my PowerPoint with you, but as you'll see, and can everyone see my PowerPoint? There's nothing that I missed, right? Is the instrument commercial paper under Article 3? What type of commercial paper is the instrument? Who are the parties to the instrument? Does it satisfy all the conditions of negotiability? Has it been properly negotiated? Is there a holder in due course and consider the shelter rule? If they're a holder in due course, they're only subject to the real offenses, not the personal offenses. Transfer warranties, present warranties, and PYOB. Pat yourself on the back because you just crushed a commercial paper essay that the person sitting next to you didn't even recognize. They saw, oh, a promissory note, whatever. I don't know what that means. Next. Like you wrote a whole two pages about, well, Johnny is a holder in due course. And, you know, Johnny has these uh, considerations, right? Is the instrument commercial paper negotiable instruments? Article three does not apply to money, payment orders, or securities. Um, again, that's just like cash or securities. If you'll see it on the test, they will show you there's some sort of note. I mean, it's not super obvious, but this is, you know, one of my favorite sayings in the Florida bar, when in doubt, write it out. If you see something that looks like commercial paper, it smells like commercial paper, it can't hurt to hit them with a commercial paper uh, essay. But again, remember, if this is all about contracts and torts, and there's one little check involved, you have to designate your time appropriately. Commercial paper has never been an issue on its own. It's always a complementary issue. The worst I've ever seen is one year they did Article 3, Article 9 in ethics, one essay. That's a brutal essay, but it's, it's manageable after today.
So is it commercial paper? What type of paper is it? And who are the parties? Notes, two party instruments, the maker, the payee, drafts, the drawer, the drawee slash payor, and then the payee. All right, now we get to the most fun part of class today. Well, I don't know, class has been super fun. We play Jeopardy. My class is always fun. What are the requirements of negotiability? Does it satisfy all conditions? A sign, written, unconditional, promise to pay, a fixed sum of money plus interest, I say with or without interest, on demand at a finite time to order bear with no additional undertakings. So here's an example of a promissory note. I, Jane Monroe, do promise to pay, promise to pay, promise to pay, City Finance Co, order paper, order paper, order paper, the sum of $5,000, $50,000, fixed amount, fixed amount, fixed amount, repayment to be made in the form of 300 equal payments, 6% interest, with or without interest, with or without interest, or $322 payable on the first of each month, at a finite time, at a finite time, at a finite time, right? Um, beginning 825 until debt is satisfied. I don't see any unconditional undertakings or it seems unconditional. Um, signed, Jane Monroe, all those elements. Now, everyone's going to ask me, Andrew, what's the difference between unconditional and no additional undertakings? It's very subtle. Unconditional means if the Eagles win the Super Bowl. Additional undertakings means you have to take this note to the top of Mount Everest to cash it in, right? It, it requires you to do something else. It's not a condition to being able to cash it in. It's an additional uh, requirement, additional undertaking, as a matter of fact. So I've done this last year. It worked because um, my students passed. So we're all going to take a, a, a piece of this. <clears throat> I'll make it easy for you, Sam. You're first. Are you with me, Sam? You're signed. Joel, I, you already know this. You're, with, you're still here? Joel, uh, he might have stepped away. No, I'm here. Sorry, right. I was on mute. You're written. All right, HDC, are you with me? Yep, I'm here. You're unconditional. That's your word. Okay. Okay. Here, say, you're with me? Oh, I'm here. Oh, you are promised to pay. Okay. Um, and Claudia, are you here? Yeah. All right, you are a fixed amount of money. That's your statement. All you guys say, just remember your saying, and you can say it whatever you want. Uh, Nico, you are, are you here? Good. I hear yes, you. Sir. You're with or without interest. Sounds good. All right. Joe, you, are you here? Yep. You're on demand or definitive time. On demand or definitive time. Um, and May, you're here? Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. You are um, to order or bear. Right? And I will be no additional undertakings. All right. So I just want to start off with the with the main rock and roll group here, um, which is Sam, Joel. I ran out of order. HDC and oh, I don't know whoever's unconditional, whoever's promised to pay. All right, S Sam. I'm gonna start with you. What's your word? Signed. All right. I want to hear it three times. What is it? Signed. 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 Okay. Now. A sign, and then who's written? I'm written. All right, practice that. Sam, you and Joel, back to forth. Sign. Sign, sign, sign. No, just one time, just one time. Sign. Written. All right, and then who's unconditional? Uh, me, unconditional. Okay, let's try that, three of you. Ready? Ready, and Sam. Sign. Signed. Written. Unconditional. And then who's promised to pay? Promised to pay. All right, let's hear that from the top. Ready and Sam. Signed. Written. Unconditional. Promise to pay. Okay. Um, now, just to remember, last year we were a little bit more creative. They were like, unconditional. You know what I mean? You can, you can have some more fun with your word. Okay, so who's fixed amount of money? Me. All right, let's hear how you're going to say it. A fixed amount of money. See, I like that. A fixed amount of money. All right, Sam, from the top. Ready and go. Signed. Written. Unconditional. Promise to pay. A fixed amount of money. Excellent. All right, who's with or without interest? That'd be me. All right, let's hear it. How, what's your flavor on with or without interest? Um, with or without interest. Excellent. All right, Sam, from the top. Signed. Written. Unconditional. 
promise to pay a fixed amount of money with or without interest okay and on demand at a bit of time who's that that's me all right let's hear it on demand or at a definitive time all right exit sam from the top signed written unconditional promise to pay a fixed amount of money with or without interest on demand or at a definitive time okay and who's to order a bear that's me all right let's hear it how's it gonna sound to order a bear all right beautiful all right sam from the top sign written unconditional promise to pay a fixed amount of money with or without interest on demand or at a definitive time to order a bear with no additional undertaking. <laughs> I'm the worst thing on earth. Um, but yes, that was awesome. A signed, written, unconditional, promise to pay, a fixed amount of money, with or without interest, on demand at a fin of time, to order a bear, with no additional <laughs> All right, ready? Who's got it? Who wants to be my, uh, who wants to prove it? All right, Joel, just show us how it's done. Let's hear it. A signed, written, unconditional, promise to pay, a fixed amount of money, with or without interest, on demand or at, at a definite time, to order a bear with no additional undertakings. Right. Excellent. I, I appreciate you because you had it a little bit, you had it right at the beginning, but you said it a little different order, which is fine. There's no order to it. But I saw that you even conformed to the new order, which shows that you're actively being active. Um, all right. Does anyone else want to try? This is the magic moment. I'll help you if you stumble, don't worry. I got you. All right, let's hear it. Signed, written, unconditional, promise to pay, um, a fixed amount of money, with or without interest, on demand, to order a bearer, With no additional <laughs> Yeah, with no additional undertakings. Yeah, I like that. I would have said on demand or definitive time. That's the only subtle thing I would have missed. Does anyone else want to try one more? I'll give it a shot. All right, let's hear it. A signed, written, promise to pay with um, signed, written, promise to pay, or unconditional. Signed, written, promise to pay um, a fixed amount of money with or without interest. Uh, on demand or at a de definitive time to order a bearer with no additional undertakings. Awesome. Anyone else want to give it a try? A signed, written, unconditional promise to pay a fixed amount of money with or without interest on demand or definitive time to order a bearer with no additional undertakings. We got to get Rihanna to sing this. All right. Just like, um, okay, good job, everyone. Please, as fun as that could possibly be, signed, written, unconditional, promise to pay, a fixed amount of money, with or without interest, on demand or definitive time to order a bear with no additional undertakings. As a matter of fact, that might be my new single from my, uh, my debut album, Restitution. Um, oh, sorry about that. So, forms of negotiation. Has it been properly negotiated? Bearer paper, transfer possession, order paper, transfer possession plus endorsement. An endorsement is a signature other than that of a signer or maker of a signer. An endorsement is a signature other than that of the signer as maker, drawer, acceptor that alone or accompanied by other words is made on the instrument, right? It's not your signature to cash it in. It's not your signature to create it. It's a signature to sign it over. Anyone know who John Hancock is? Why, does anyone know why we call a signature John Hancock? It's a signature in the Declaration of Independence. Yes, he was the one who was like, you know what, let me <laughs> sign this real big. Everyone knows the job. Um, the holder is the holder of due course. Um, a holder has both the possession and rights to an instrument. The first holder is the payee of the instrument, right? The first holder is the payee, obviously, because that's who, can, that's who it's written to. But then they can transfer it. And remember, that's what makes... Commercial paper negotiable as it can be transferred. 
So subsequent parties become holders of their possession of bearer paper or properly endorsed order paper. They take the instrument for value in good faith without notice. The shelter rule provides that the transfer of an instrument acquires the same rights that the transfer had. Thus, a person who does not himself qualify as a holder in due course can still acquire that status if some previous holder, someone upstream, was a holder in due course. As we said, the holder in due course takes free of the personal offenses, only so to the real defenses, for on the factum, alteration, illegality, incapacity, duress, discharge in court, um, statute of limitations. So this right here, and I'm going to put it in the chat if I can. If I can. Yeah, I'm gonna put it in the chat. You know, I have um, some favorite websites that I've learned from. And one of them is this, uh, this website. Another one that I shared with everyone was for Crim Law um, and Crim Pro. It was Hornsby. Hornsby is awesome for Florida, you know, rules of murder and things like that. This one, uh, sailor.org.github.io is awesome for commercial paper and even secure transactions. He has a whole chapter on holder in due course and what it means. Um, honestly, like, if after my lecture, you still feel like you, you don't know enough and you don't understand it, I would highly recommend reading uh, his chapters on, on commercial paper. He does a really great job of like, yeah, it's not short, but it's, um, it's good. So that was just something I wanted to share with everyone. I, I like him. Um, transfer warranties. These are the official transfer warranties that I was talking about. The transfer is entitled to enforce the instrument. All signatures on the instrument are authentic and authorized. The instrument has not been altered. The instrument is not subject to a defense or claim in recoupment of any party that can be assessed by warrant. Does anyone know what recoupment means? Um, like, I guess a claim to, to get back whatever it is that you gave away. Yeah, it's usually by a third party, right? Like you owe me money, so I'm gonna recoup that money you owe me from that instrument, right? That That's what recoupment would mean. Um, the warrant has no knowledge of any insolvency proceeding commenced with respect to the maker acceptor, or in the case of an unaccepted draft, the drawer. And then presentment warranties. So remember, transfer warranties and presentment warranties. The warrantor is or was a person entitled to enforce the check. The check has not been altered, right? The pretty much the same. The warrantor has no knowledge that the drawer signature is forged, and for a remotely created consumer check that the account holder authorized the issuance and amount of the check. Any questions? Call me, beat me if you want to reach me. Live your life, live it right, be different, do different things. Kendra Damar. Um, cool. I got a quick question, uh, I guess, for, for the shelter rule. Um, sure. Does it have to be the immediate uh, like predecessor who, who transferred it to you, or is it anyone upstream? Anyone, they all will. So if you have hold of due court status, I, you transfer to me, I take shelter. I transfer to Johnny, Johnny takes shelter. Once there's a holder in due course, anyone who takes uh, downstream from them will take shelter. Okay. Um, let's see, just quickly go over uh, this outline. And then this afternoon we'll go over some, you know, essays like we always do to see how it appears. But like I'm telling you all, commercial paper rarely shows up, actually has never shown up on its own. And when it does show up, it's usually part of a uh, contracts or maybe torts or even real property if it's separate from the mortgage. But look out for promissory notes for checks and just be comfortable that you can spit out that sign written unconditional promise to pay, fix some money with or without interest on demand or definitive time to order bearer to know that you'll undertake. If you can do that, you're going to be fine. So we say, what is commercial paper, checks, promissory notes, governed by Article 3, right? Central issue is, are they a holder in due course? And um, it's in special form. If it's negotiable, it can be transferred by negotiation. We talked about a uh, note versus a draft, right? Two-party versus three-party instruments, elements of negotiability. And again, this is what you'll do on an essay. You'll talk about all the elements of negotiability, sign, rate, unconditional promise, et cetera, et cetera. But then you'll go through here, it was signed. Here, there was a, right, you want to go through all the elements, just like any other analysis. Um, fixed amount of money to order bear. The one that they usually try to do is a condition. If the ego's <laughs> uh, order bear, 
uh, on a minute definitive time, no undertakings, right? Negotiation, bare order. You could have a blank endorsement, like a blank check, right? It's pretty much bare paper if you give someone a blank check. Um, this is the central theme. You want to, if you see commercial paper, you want to mention the word holder in due course, right? Like that's your goal is to get to, are they a holder in due course? Um, if the holder does not qualify as a holder in due course, but the transferee of a holder in course, they receive the rights of a holder in course unless the holder is a party to fraud involving the instrument. The shelter rule, same as a BFP in property. Um, good faith, notice, all that. Claims and defenses on negotiable instrument. These are the real defenses. Let's get it. Forgery, fraud in the factum, alteration of the instrument, incapacity to contract, infancy, illegality, duress, discharge and insolvency proceedings, statute of limitations, and yeah, suretyship. We pretty much nailed it. We missed infancy and incapacity and forgery, but they all sound about right. Um, base, fraudery, alteration, adjudicate incompetency, infancy, oh, that's the only thing, infancy, illegality, duress, discharge by insolvency, statute of limitations, suretyship. Again, fades, holder in due course. Sign written unconditional promise of fix it, right? It's just like memorizing these words. And if you could get them out in your exam, you're going to do just fine. I'm telling you, people have passed the bar exam completely missing commercial paper issues. Like they'll write a whole essay, there's a commercial paper issue, and they just didn't even write about it. So my goal is for my students to feel confident that if they see check or promissory note and it seems like it's a commercial paper thing going on, they're going to be able to get a lot of these buzzwords. Um, so who can, uh, bring trial or holder, someone with rights or someone who's entitled to enforce it. What does this mean? Vouching in. It is possible to vouch in parties to an instrument may be allowed with a party sued. To vouch in a third party may, a third, to vouch in a third party, the defendant must get a third party notice of litigation. If after receiving notice, the third party fails to appear in the fend, can be bound by any determination of fact commonly sued against them by the party giving notice. That's just a new phrase for me, even vouching in. You can vouch in a party to an instrument who may be liable. Um, liabilities. Many bar exam questions deal with the liabilities of the parties to an instrument. You should first identify the status of each party and then discuss their liability, right? So the maker of the note who issued it, the endorser will have secondary liability who, who signed it, right? The presentment. Dishonor occurs when the maker or drawer does not pay within the allowed time after presentment, so they dishonored it. Notice of a dishonor. Endorser is not liable on an instrument unless she's given timely notice that the instrument has been dishonored and generally must give 30 days after dishonor. I've really never seen that tested. Um, the transfer warranties we talked about. Transfer warranties and presentment warranties. That was Jeopardy question 500 today. She is entitled to enforce the instrument. All signatures are authentic and authorized. The instrument or item has not been altered. No defense or claim of recoupment is good. She has no knowledge of any insolvency proceedings. When exam question requires you to consider the liability of an endorser, don't forget to discuss both her contract liability and her warranty liability and why either or both are applicable or inapplicable. Show presentment dishonor notice of dishonor trilogy, trilogy and applicable transfer warranties. So uh, this is a thing that we, we could add, the presentment dishonor notice trilogy, meaning you presented it, they dishonored it by not paying it. Now you provide them 30 day notice and you know we have, that's how the claim will work. I like that. The presentment dishonor notice trilogy. If you could say that in your test, you are killing it. Um, drawer will have secondary liability. Just like we said, the endorser will have secondary liability. Um, the draw E, the draw of a draft cannot have any liability unless and until she signs the instrument, right? Once you sign something and endorse it, you become a secondarily liable on it. Subrogation, a bank that pays a check is subrogated as to the rights of the person it pays against the customer. Thus, if a bank pays a hold in due course, it can assume the position of a hold in due course and attempting to charge its customer's account. So subrogation, again, a term I've never seen on an essay. Stop payment orders must be in writing and buying for six months. An acceptor signs a draft and thereby becomes primarily bound to pay the instrument. This process is called presentment for acceptance. Um, an accommodation party signs an instrument to lend his credit to another party to the instrument and receive no benefit. He is a surety. Um, generally, an unauthorized signature is ineffective as a signature of the person whose name is signed, but is effective as the signature of the signer, right? Like 
I can't sign on behalf of someone else, but I can sign for myself. Um, just some issues. Um, alteration and incomplete instruments. An alteration is an unauthorized change that purports to modify the obligation of any party. Its effect depends whether the alter's intent was fraudulent or non-fraudulent. Non-fraudulent alteration, this does not discharge the party and the instrument may be enforced. Fraudulent alteration, unless the party has censored a stop from altering the alter from asserting the alteration, a fraudulent alteration discharges all parties except the payer bank, a drawee paying a fraudulent altered instrument, or a holder in due course may enforce the instrument. And then payment, you know, um, note the difference in result between a forged drawer signature and a forged endorser signature. If a bank pays out on a forged drawer signature, payment is final and the bank cannot recover the money back because no presentment warranty is broken. So the bank pays out on a forged drawer signature. But if a bank pays out on a forged endorser signature, a presentment warranty is broken, the presenter did not have the right to enforce against the drawer because of forgery. It's fair enough. And then the last thing is discharge. An instrument itself never dies by discharge because discharge of a party is a personal offense which a holder in due course can cut off. No discharge of any party is effective against a subsequent holder in due course unless the holder in due course has notice of the offenses when he takes the instrument. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, again, the last like four or five pages of this, I don't care if that went totally over your head. I was just reading it aloud so you could hear some buzzwords and maybe, you know, know some more things, maybe the presentment dishonor notice of dishonor trilogy. But what I shared with you all on the PowerPoint is what we need to know about commercial paper. Is it commercial paper under Article 3? Who are the parties? Has it satisfied the conditions of negotiability? Has the holder become a holder in due course and consider the shelter rule? Presentment warranties, transfer warranties. If you can walk the reader through that, takes a page and you can say, and I'll end by asking someone, what are the conditions of negotiability for commercial paper? Anyone feel like they can say it smoothly? Signed, written, unconditional, promise to pay, fixed amount of money, um, with or without interest, on demand or definite time, to order a bearer with no additional undertakings. And with that, my job here is done. <laughs>